For centuries, people have asked the question, who is the Antichrist? What is the significance of Jezebel? Who or what is Mystery Babylon? Who is the false prophet? And much more. In a generation of unprecedented events, where the pages of Revelation seem to be coming to life before our very eyes, the answer to some of these questions are sometimes so obvious, yet many of them have been missed, and in some cases covered up and hidden away by unseen spiritual forces operating in the heavenlies. And they have a plan that was decided many centuries ago, since the days when Lucifer fell on his pride and arrogance, taking one third of God's angels with him. They have been here for many generations, working behind the scenes to pervert, corrupt, and extinguish the kingdom of God and heaven. And now, the time has come for the enemies of hell to make their final move in their sinister game of chess. Will your eyes be opened and will you be prepared for what is coming? Or will you choose to remain asleep? Either way, the enemy is making his final play. Your entire future will depend on what you do next. As was recorded in Hosea 4 verse 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. And so it is that the story begins. Before we even begin, we must understand what is the Vatican. Here is something Herbert W. Armstrong wrote in an October 1951 Plain Truth article titled, The Pope Plans to Move the Vatican. I hope you will listen closely because it is profound. Under the subhead, The Great Unrecognized Dictatorship, the article said, How many have realized these staggering facts? The oldest political dictatorship on earth is the Vatican. The Roman Catholic Church is far more than a religion. It is also politically a world power. And how many people know that the real objective of the Catholic political power is precisely the same as the goals of communism and fascism, to gain dominance, control, and rule over the whole world. Of course, it is generally known that most nations send ambassadors to the Vatican, and papal ambassadors are established in most world capitals. But it has not been generally grasped that this Roman system is much more than a church. It is a state called in the Encyclopedia Britannica an ecclesiastical world empire. It is a political dictatorship. It is a world power whose influence in many respects outweighs that of any nation on earth. The Vatican is a dictatorship. It is literally a state with political interest, foreign policy, sovereign independence, recognition under international law, official relations, diplomatic immunity, administrative departments, ambassadors, a central bank, a capital, a very centralized government, and a man who dictates. How many people, how many Catholics, really grasp and understand this? The Vatican governs 1.2 billion Catholics around the world, and it influences millions of other people as well as national governments. Mr. Armstrong continued, 
I'm not here saying anything about or against Catholic people either in the United States or elsewhere. Nor am I here saying anything about the Catholic religion save that it is pagan, cloaking the original Chaldean mysteries in the garb of Christianity, falsely so labeled and deceiving its own adherents, who are quite often sincere and devout with its sense of healing pomp, ceremony, mysticism, and superstition. But what I am here concerned with is Catholic political power. The papacy is a world power, a dictatorship bent on conquering and ruling the world. The Catholic Church has been making stronger and more blatant moves at getting the world ready for that great day of the Lord. But who exactly is their Lord? It is paramount for the Christian today to be able to clearly discern the many ways the devil is using to prepare an unsuspecting world to accept the mark of the beast. In order to have a full understanding of the papacy's modern movements and decisions, we must understand the role of the Jesuit order and how the papacy has been utilizing the Jesuit order to covertly incorporate their schemes for many years. Recently, I went into great detail about the Jesuit order in another video, which was a documentary, which covered the Jesuits, the papacy, as well as the NAR and more. But for this video, I'm going to cover some more information and details that I didn't share in the previous video. So pay attention. The constitution of the Jesuits states, let whoever desires to fight under the sacred banner of the cross and to serve only God and the Roman pontiff, his vicar on earth, after a solemn vow of perpetual chastity, let him keep in mind that he is part of a society instituted for the purpose of perfecting souls in life and in Christian doctrine for the propagation of the faith. Let all members know, and let it be not only at the beginning of their profession, but let them think over it daily as long as they live, that the society as a whole and each of them owes obedience to our most holy Lord, the Pope, and the other Roman pontiffs, his successors, and a fight with faithful obedience for God. And that again was the constitution of the Jesuits. But why was the Jesuit order created? The Jesuit order or the Society of Jesus, also called Jesuits today, was founded by a man named Ignatius of Loyola, born in 1491. He maintained a military career as a Spanish knight until he was severely wounded at the Battle of Pamplona in 1521. While he was in recovery, he supposedly went through some sort of spiritual conversion. He then combined his military experience with his newfound religious conversion to decide that his religion needed an army. Thus he created the Society of Jesus under the banner of Roman Catholicism. With several of his companions, he formed the Jesuit order in 1534, and it was officially commissioned and sanctioned by Pope Paul III in 1540. Ignatius was also commissioned by the Pope to reorganize the Bank of Rome in 1540. In its early stages, just after they were reorganizing the Bank of Rome, they began ruthlessly taking over education, taking over the schools and the colleges would allow them access to change teachings. The primary purpose of the newly created Jesuit order was to serve as the Pope's deterrent to the Protestant Reformation. The Jesuit Oath, as taken from Political and Economic Handbook by Thomas Edward Watson in 1916, page 437, he states, I do declare from my heart, without mental reservation, that the Pope is Christ's Vicar General, and he hath power to depose heretical kings, princes, states, that they may safely be destroyed, Therefore, to the utmost of my power, I will defend this doctrine. I do further declare the doctrine of the Church of England, of the Calvinists, the Huguenots, and other Protestants to be damnable 
and those to be damned who will not forsake the same. I do further declare that I will help, assist, and advise all or any of His Holiness agents in any place wherever I shall be, and do my utmost to exterminate the heretical Protestant doctrine and to destroy all their pretended power. Again, that was a quote, the Jesuit Oath, as taken from Political and Economic Handbook by Thomas Edward Watson from 1916, page 437. The Jesuit Order would become the Papacy's Counter-Reformation. The Reformation, started by Reformed Catholics, such as Martin Luther, began as a wave of truth in the 1500s, calling out and exposing the abominable heresies of the Catholic Church. It was mostly through the papacy selling of indulgences or certificates of pardon that the Reformation was flamed to life. Luther was outraged when members of the university were handing him these requests for pardon of sin. He quickly told them that unless they actually repent of their sins, coming before the throne of grace for forgiveness, they would unfortunately perish in those sins. He began teaching people that the grace of God cannot be purchased, that God's grace is a free gift. His opposition to Catholic doctrines began riling up the entire Catholic order against him. This should be a lesson to us today. When the Holy Spirit reveals great truth to us and calls us to spread the word to others, the enemy will stir up the powers of this world against us. We must rely on God in these situations and not on our own wisdom. So where does this all fit in to the banking system and the economy? Well, the reorganized Bank of Rome began branching out and opening various offices throughout Europe. Some of the banks they opened up were Venice in 1587, the Whistle Bank in Amsterdam in 1609, Hamburg in 1619, Nuremberg 1621, Rotterdam 1635, and the Bank of England in 1694. The Bank of England, having its model after the Bank of Rome and created by the Jesuits, actually became the world's first central bank. This central bank began the process of issuing notes, charging interest on the entire capital they loaned to the English Parliament. This began a spiral of recurring debt for England as there would be no way for them to fully repay their lenders, thus putting the power of the country of England into the hands of the Jesuits who controlled the central bank. My friends, it is for this very reason, the usury of the central bank in England, that the American colonists sought freedom from England and the reason for the Revolutionary War. Benjamin Franklin, when speaking about the use of colonial scripts, said, that is simple. In the colonies, we issue our own paper money. It is called a colonial scrip. We issue it in proper proportion to make the goods and pass easily from the producers to the consumers. In this manner, creating ourselves our own paper money, we control its purchasing power and we have no interest to pay to no one. And Benjamin Franklin also stated when speaking about the real cause of the Revolutionary War banking control, the colonies would gladly have borne the little tax on tea and other matters had it not been the poverty caused by the bad influence of the English bankers on the parliament, which has caused in the colonies hatred of England and the Revolutionary War. And one more noteworthy statement by Benjamin Franklin on the corruption of the Bank of England was the refusal of King George III to allow the colonies to operate an honest money system which freed the ordinary man from the clutches of the money manipulators was probably the prime cause of the revolution. The central banking system that exists in our world today is merely the same central banking system modeled after the original Bank of Rome and the Jesuits control it, as they always have. The Jesuits today have a great influence on modern Christianity and sadly, so many Christians today do not even know where many of the most commonly accepted beliefs even come from or why they were developed. Throughout dark ages, the papacy resorted to very open and obvious brutal and cruel tactics of attempting to fully wipe out all Bible-believing heretics. 
The development of the Protestant Reformation proved to the papacy that these tactics would not suffice any longer. The Jesuits were created and commissioned nearly 500 years ago. Since that time, not only have they corrupted the Christian faith and moved the world's religions toward ecumenical unity, but they have also infiltrated the economic systems and political infrastructure of the countries of this world. Through many of their agencies and societies spread worldwide, they have provided the papacy with the convenience of directing and influencing this world's major affairs. And some of their agencies are the European Commission, Council on Foreign Relations, United Nations, Trilateral Commission, the Bilderberg Group, the Central Banking Systems, NATO, Freemasonry, and the Club of Rome. Again, those are just some of their agencies. Especially since the Vatican's noticeable increase in power, the Jesuits have been able to increase the frequency of their subtle tactics even in the realm of politics. Number one, most people are duped into believing that there is a constant argument or debate going on or war between the left and the right. However, through a left versus right Hegelian dialectic philosophy, the Jesuits have been able to intuitively use a create and control thesis and antithesis methodology. They create a mirage for the people of the country by giving them Republican versus Democratic slash conservative versus liberal to choose from when truly they control both parties. Any person showing any true political opposition to the Jesuit controlled duopoly is eventually extinguished by some of the Jesuits various outlets such as their mainstream media networks. Number two, through their various fascist like internationalization projects, they have been able to gradually merge countries together in unions. Some of their such unions, which already exist, are Central American Union, European Union, African Union, South American Union, and the Asian Union. Other unions are still in the works, but are very close to being completed. It is through disinformation and other forms of social engineering that the Jesuits coerce their hand. If these methods do not work fully at first, then they implement more open attacks such as war creation. If you notice, the United States still has a constitution and the North American Union has not yet been completely realized. What is the result? The United States has been constantly at war for over 10 years. This will continue until the United States is fully internationalized like Europe. And finally, number three, through the Jesuits' brother organization, the Sovereign Military Order of Malta, or SMOM, they have been able to gain control of the entire money-making process. The Federal Reserve Banking System, Citibank, Bank of America, and Goldman Sachs are just three examples of their pawn elite banks. They also flex their dominion through their International Monetary Fund, or IMF, World Bank, Rockefeller Foundation, and many other such international societies. In a nutshell, the Jesuits have complete control of the direction of every monetary currency in the modern world. All the events you see circulating around the economies of various countries growing weaker is no accident. But the rabbit hole really does go deeper and deeper. It would take many weeks to fully illustrate just how interconnected the devil's societies are in this corrupted world. However, one quick and clear connection can be made with all of the secret societies of this world which give allegiance to the papacy, and they are shrouded in occultic Satanism. The goat of Mendez or Pan or Baphomet in other cultures is a symbol of fertility worship also associated with Baal, the false sun god mentioned in the Old Testament. Baphomet has also become a symbol of satanic worship today. Many of the societies just mentioned, such as the Freemasons, are highly grounded in fertility false god worship and affiliation. Many of the presidents, political leaders, prime ministers, celebrities, big corporate CEOs, 
and other famous people are tied into different varieties of the occult. Why would all of these people and so many more be making such a distinct motion with their hands? The hand sign that you see these people in high places of power invoking are all different forms of the sigil of Baphomet, denoted by the original picture of Baphomet seen on the screen. The Freemasons themselves have been used by the Vatican to unite the powers of this world for some time, and they are very satanic. Take a look at this picture of a very interesting poster of Baphomet from the Order of Eastern Templars. Notice the title, Do What Thou Wilt. That is exactly what Satan said to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. You'll also see the all-seeing eye at the very top. This symbol is also a Freemason symbol, a reference of the Masons to Solomon, where Solomon says the eyes of the Lord are in every place. The Freemasons believe they should keep an eye on every place. The reference to Solomon comes from the Freemasons' desire to rebuild Solomon's temple, one of the evil ones that Solomon built for Molech after Solomon turned away from the Lord. There are also two obelisks as well. An obelisk itself represents male fertility or the male phallus and the ability to supposedly harness demonic power within the structure. Very satanic and pagan obelisks are all over the world, most notably at the Vatican's St. Peter's Basilica. Beside each obelisk, you'll see the Baphomet cross. This cross can be seen all over Masonic lodges and temples, as well as on the attire of the 33-degree Freemasons. The six-pointed star hexagram can be seen at the bottom on the left, inside the seven-pointed object. Many today believe that the Star of David, a six-pointed hexagram, came from David, but it did not. That star is used today by the Jews as a symbol of Israel has nothing at all to do with God or with King David, but actually came from ancient forms of witchcraft, occultism, and sorcery. Like other symbols in Freemasonry, the hexagram represents the fertility god, the male triangle penetrating the female triangle. The hexagram was also used as a means of attempting to communicate with the dead in ancient Egypt. However, if we read scripture, we know that these sorcerers were not communicating with the dead, but with demons. The dead know nothing, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5. We can see that the Catholic Church, through their manipulative Jesuit order, has indeed acquired control of all the major facets of society, the world's economics, politics, and religions. There are still only a few cards left to be drawn, but in order for the papacy to enforce the mark of the beast, it is necessary that she control the world under one unified system. And with recent events, we are already seeing this becoming close to being fully implemented. But does scripture indicate that the harlot church will control the world society in this way? Revelation 18 verses 2 and 3 says, and he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. There is a lot of prophecy jam-packed into those two verses. What does wine represent prophetically in scripture? A covenant of accepting religious doctrine. And you can see that in Luke 5:37. All nations have drunk of the wine, or doctrine, of the wrath of her fornication. The whore of Babylon acquires religious control of the earth by getting everyone to accept the church's doctrine over the laws of God. Number two, the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The whore of Babylon acquires political control of the earth by having the political leaders of this world give full allegiance to her. And finally, number three, the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. The whore of Babylon acquires economic control of the earth 
by maintaining positive control of the currency of the world. In the three angels message, are we given additional insight into this? Notice that the angel says that Babylon the great is fallen is fallen. Mystery Babylon will fully acquire all three facets of society. But what is the primary reason that God's wrath is finally poured upon the world? Revelation 14 verses 6 through 12. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Mystery Babylon, the mother harlot, forces the earth to accept her doctrines. Then we are warned that if any person receives the mark based upon what was just stated, the wine of her wrath, then that person will receive God's final judgments and will be forever separated from him, being destroyed in the lake of fire. Amazingly enough, the last part of this great message is that those who do not receive the mark of the beast will be those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Clearly, the message is that God's wrath is ultimately poured out upon the world because of the world legislating papal doctrine into law, forcing the world to disobey God's law. My friends, this is why the Jesuits have been working secretly so hard over the many years to prepare this unsuspecting, docile world to be fully controlled by the papacy again. Take a good look around this world. Countries are quickly losing their sovereignty, moving toward a global system which is encouraged by some of the Jesuit-controlled agencies such as the United Nations. The economic stature of the most powerful countries in the world is preparing to collapse, which will usher in a global monetary system, which we're seeing happen right now. All of the world's religions are being convinced to come together through the merging ecumenical movement. And most of the professing Christians themselves even believe that God is on their side, guiding this religious transition. Oh, how Satan has this world so fooled. So before we go any further, let me just ask you this. Where is your walk currently with the Lord Jesus? Are you fully prepared to stand on that troublesome day, which is coming so soon? It is critically important for your salvation that you completely understand the word of the Lord and that you completely understand the things that are coming upon us. Scripture warns us that these exact events would happen and it illustrates the truth so that we do not have to guess or speculate about this topic my friends before we go further i just want to make clear if you understand god's word and hide it in your heart and if you look to jesus christ and you trust in him you have nothing to fear and nothing to worry about only fear god and god alone and trust in him and unite your heart with him in true praise and true worship. In just a moment, we're going to move along to some other subjects so that I can tie everything together by the end of this. However, before we do, I want to share some quotes 
that also expose the Jesuit order, starting with the Bible. When we look at the book of Jude, we can see how the spirit of evil has done all to infiltrate the God-like tares to try and destroy the ways of the Lord and people's lives. The Bible says in Jude chapter 1 verse 4, For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 7.15 says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. The following quotes will expose the Jesuit order even further for you, so if there is any doubt in your mind, maybe these quotes from well-known people will help you to understand and to believe just how evil this is. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 13 through 15 says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now that particular passage also will apply to another group of individuals who are deceitfully wicked I'm going to be sharing with you later in this video. Here's a quote from J.E.C. Shepard, a Canadian historian. He said of the Jesuits, Between 1555 and 1931, the Society of Jesus, or the Jesuits, was expelled from at least 83 countries, city-states, and cities for engaging in political intrigue and subversive plots against the welfare of the state, according to the records of a Jesuit priest of repute. Practically every instance of expulsion was for political intrigue, political infiltration, political subversion, and inciting to political insurrection. And as a side note, many of these nations where the Jesuits were expelled had Roman Catholic monarchs. Again, that was J.E.C. Shepard, a Canadian historian. Next is a quote from the third Jesuit superior general from 1565 to 1572, and that was Francesco Borgia. We came in like lambs and will rule like wolves. We shall be expelled like dogs and return like eagles. Next is a quote from John Adams, 1735 to 1826 and President of the United States. To Thomas Jefferson, an inquiry into the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, November 4, 1816. My history of the Jesuits is not eloquently written, but it is supported by unquestionable authorities and is very particular and very horrible. There, the Jesuit orders, restoration in 1814 by Pope Pius VII, is indeed a step toward darkness cruelty, despotism, and death. I do not like the appearance of the Jesuits. If ever there was a body of men who merited eternal damnation on earth and in hell, it is the Society of Ignatius de Loyola. Again, that was John Adams. Here's a quote from Samuel Morse, 1791 to 1872. He was the American inventor of the telegraph, author of the book Foreign Conspiracy Against the Liberties of the United States. He said, the Jesuits are a secret society, a sort of Masonic order, with superadded features of revolting odiousness and a thousand times more dangerous. Here is a quote by Marcus de Lafayette, 1757 to 1834. He was a French statesman and general. He served in the American Continental Army under the command of General George Washington during the American Revolutionary War. He said, It is my opinion that if the liberties of this country, the United States of America, are destroyed, it will be by the subtlety of the Roman Catholic Jesuit priest, for they are the most crafty, dangerous enemies to civil and religious liberty. They have instigated most of the wars of Europe. 
Next was a quote from Abraham Lincoln, 1809 to 1865, the 16th President of the United States. Here he was speaking of the American Civil War of 1861 to 1865. He said, The war would never have been possible without the sinister influence of the Jesuits. Napoleon, 1769 to 1821, the Emperor of the French, stated, the Jesuits are a military organization, not a religious order. Their chief is a general of an army, not the mere father abbot of a monastery. And the aim of this organization is power, power in its most despotic exercise, absolute power, universal power, power to control the world by the volition of a single man. Jesuitism is the most absolute of despotisms and at the same time the greatest and most enormous of abuses. Again, that was a quote from Napoleon. The next quote is from Pope Clement XIV, who had forever abolished the Jesuit order in 1773. Alas, I knew they, the Jesuits, would poison me, but I did not expect to die in so slow and cruel a manner. The next two quotes are chilling statements made by Adolf Hitler, 1889 to 1945. And most of you are aware, I'm sure, that he was the Nazi leader and chancellor of Germany from 1933 to 1945. He said, above all I have learned from the Jesuits, and so did Lenin too, as far as I recall. The world has never known anything quite so splendid as the hierarchical structure of the Roman Catholic Church. There were quite a few things I simply appropriated from the Jesuits for the use of the Nazi party. And here is his second quote. I will tell you a secret. I am founding an order in Himmler. I see our Ignatius de Loyola, the Jesuit founder. And most of you I'm sure are aware that Himmler would later become the head of the Nazi SS. And John F. Kennedy, the 35th President of the United States, in his address to the Greater Houston Ministerial Association, September 12, 1960, stated, I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute. I believe in an America that is officially neither Catholic, Protestant, nor Jewish, where no public official either requests or accepts instructions on public policy from the Pope, the National Council of Churches, or any other ecclesiastical source, where no religious body seeks to impose its will directly or indirectly upon the general populace of the public acts of its officials. Again, that was John F. Kennedy. I guess he would not have gone over well with the new apostolic dominionist reformation movement. Alberto Rivera, 1982, a Spanish-American ex-Jesuit said, I operated behind the shadows in the assassination of John F. Kennedy through the parish of the Holy Spirit in Houston, Texas. In that parish, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, President of the United States, was already scheduled. Quite frightening is his statement. And just a few more quotes. This one is from Pax Americana equals Pax Romana. The America that we all knew and loved has been taken over by an alien force. This alien force is called the Society of Jesuits, or the Society of Jesus. The Gestapo of the Vatican, banned from every Catholic country in Europe, including Japan and China. They were even outlawed by the Pope himself, Clement XIV, in 1773. Taking advantage of our freedom of religion, they flocked to the U.S. and have taken over the Pentagon. The U.S. has faced no military threat since Civil War. The militia of the U.S. is the armed citizen, the watchman on the wall of freedom, not the standing army run by Jesuit priests. America has become the dictatress of the world. Most of our brave politicians in Washington, D.C. are terrified of these men in long dresses. They are afraid of ending up like President John F. Kennedy. And last but not least, Michelangelo Tamburini, who was the 14th Jesuit Superior General from 1706 to 1730, said, and his statement is quite chilling, See, sir, from this chamber, I govern not only to Paris, but to China, not only to China, but to all the world without anyone knowing how I do it. And that concludes 
Some of the famous quotations made by very famous well-known people about the evils of the Jesuit order. It may seem a bit odd that suddenly I'm jumping from the Jesuits to Jezebel. However, I can assure you that the story of Jezebel has everything to do not only with what has already happened in the past, but what is going to take place here in the near future in these end times and what is happening right now. Which leads us to the next question. Who was Jezebel in the Bible and what was she really like? Queen Jezebel was the daughter of Ethbaal, king of Sidon, and the wife of Ahab, king of Israel. Jezebel promoted the worship of false gods in Israel, harassed and killed God's prophets, and arranged for an innocent man to be falsely charged and executed. King Ahab, who did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any king of Israel before him, married Jezebel, making her the queen over Israel. We learn in 1 Kings 16.31, Jezebel was the daughter of Ethbaal, who was king of the Sidonians or Phoenicians. Before becoming king, Ethbaal was noted to have been a priest of Astarte, which was the Greek form of the moon goddess Ashtoreth. Astarte is what the Phoenicians called her. According to Easton's Bible Dictionary, Ashtoreth was frequently associated with the name of Baal the sun god, the Phoenicians' chief male deity. Now, please note that Baal also is the nature god with which they worshipped Mother Nature and the Earth, and the name Ashtoreth, Astarte, also is the same in different cultures as Isis, Semiramis, and many, many more. Not only had Ethbaal been a priest of these particular gods, but he was also the king of Tyre and Sidon, and so Jezebel was a princess. Jezebel's father, Ethbaal, was politically connected to King Ahab in Israel, which could explain the marriage between the two. This influence led to the promotion of false gods among the people of Israel, which angered God. As detailed in 1 Kings 16 verses 31 and 32, Jezebel persuaded her husband to promote the worship of deities, Baal and Asherah, among the people of Israel. It was common during this era of kingdoms for the king to establish worship facilities for foreign wives. In this case, Jezebel required the installation of a temple and an altar for Baal, which was built in Samaria. Since she was Phoenician, Jezebel more than likely had a role that was more active than what was normal in Hebrew rule. During Ahab's reign in Israel, the people were deeply divided as to either worship and serve Baal or the Lord. Animosities were so heightened that Jezebel ordered the death of the Lord's prophets while she fully supported the prophets of Baal and Asherah. Obadiah was a governor in the region who greatly feared the Lord. He protected 100 of the Lord's prophets, hiding them in caves and feeding them. And you can read about that in 1 Kings 18, 3 through 4. Now, we had discussed when we were talking about Jezebel, some of the different names of these goddesses. You can see here on the screen, Semiramis, the mother and wife of Nimrod slash Baal. She was called Ishtar, pronounced Easter in English, Astarte, Ashtoreth, and Isis in Egypt. Now, Mary, the Catholic Church. Now stay with me because I'm going to show you more information that gives extra evidence to the things I'm going to reveal to you as we go through the remainder of this video. So you can see right here the striking similarities and I have more to show you. This is also where the Statue of Liberty comes from and Starbucks and a lot more. Wait till you see this. Here we have it in the background in the Catholic Church, and we can see Pope Francis there. Of course, that's their Mother Mary. Now, let me just make a comment that what I am saying here, I am not talking about the real Mother Mary or baby Jesus, of course. Please note that the Catholics who highly revere the Mother Mary and worship her, 
believe that they are indeed worshiping the real Mother Mary. Here's another picture. Samiramis and Nimrod and the baby Jesus and Mary. And then down here you can see, same thing, Samiramis and Nimrod, Mother Mary, baby Jesus. And here's another one. So this goes all the way back to Nimrod and his mother or wife. Here's another one. Quite interesting, to say the least. So before we jump ahead, we're going to go back to Ethbael, Jezebel's father, and share some information about him because this is all very important that you understand this. Ethbael was a king of Tyre who founded a new dynasty. During his reign, Tyre expanded its power on the mainland, making all of Phoenicia's territory as far north as Beirut, including Sidon, and even a part of the island of Cyprus. At the same time, Tyre also built new overseas colonies. Primary information related to Ethbael comes from Josephus's citation of the Phoenician author Menandor of Ephesus. Here it is said that the previous king, Feles, was slain by Ethbalus, the priest of Astarte, who reigned 32 years and lived 68 years. He was succeeded by his son, Batazorus, Baal Esser. Ethbael held close diplomatic contacts with King Ahab of Israel. First Kings 1631 relates that his daughter Jezebel married Ahab 874 to 853 BC and Phoenician influence in Samaria and the other Israelite cities was extensive. In the First Kings passage, Ethbael is labeled King of the Sidonians. At this time, Tyre and Sidon were consolidated into one kingdom. Menander's comment that Ethbael had been a priest of Astarte before becoming king explains why his daughter Jezebel was so zealous in the promotion of the Phoenician gods, thus leading to the conflicts between Elijah and Jezebel's forces described in 1 Kings 18 and 19. Menander's further statement that her father was a murderer sheds some light on her choice of a way to solve the Naboth problem in 1 Kings 21. So now that I've shown you some pictures and given you a little bit of background on Ethbael, which you need to just make a note of because it's going to be very important here soon, let's go ahead and dig even deeper and find out who is this Queen of Heaven. It's curious to me that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is so often called the Queen of Heaven. It's curious to me because the Bible speaks about the Queen of Heaven as it relates to idols. Specifically, the Queen of Heaven in the Bible refers to a goddess that goes by many names, including Isis, Inanna, Astarte, Hera, and Asherah. As I have shown you, the wicked Queen Jezebel worshipped Asherah. Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 17 through 19 warns against making altars to the Queen of Heaven. Do you not see what they do in the cities of Judah? and in the streets of Jerusalem. The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough, to make cakes to the Queen of Heaven, and to pour out drink offerings to other gods, and that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, says the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the shame of their own faces? The Bible speaks of Jezebel and her witchcrafts in 2 Kings 9.22. The spirit of Jezebel is the same as Asherah, also known as Ashtoreth. And as we've just discussed, Jezebel's father, Ethbaal, was the high priest of the goddess Ashtoreth, the queen of heaven. Can you connect the dots now? Mary in the Bible, Jesus' mother, is not a queen of heaven. It is also of great importance that we understand a little bit of history about Tyre and Sidon, Tyre is an ancient Phoenician port city which is known as the birthplace of Europa, who gave Europe its name and is also depicted in the book of Revelation, and Dido of Carthage, who is the god known for giving aid to and falling in love with Aeneas of Troy. The name also means rock, and the city consisted of two parts, the main trade center on an island, and Old Tyre about a half a mile opposite on the mainland. 
The old city known as Ushu was founded in 2750 BCE and the trade center grew up shortly after. In time, the island complex became more prosperous and populated than Ushu and was heavily fortified. The prosperity of Tyre attracted the attention of King Nebuchadnezzar II of Babylon, who lay siege to the city for 13 years in the 6th century BCE without breaking their defenses. During this siege, most of the inhabitants of the mainland city abandoned it for the relative safety of the island city. Ushu became a suburb of Tyre on the mainland and remained so until the coming of Alexander the Great. The Tyrians were known as workers in dye from the shells of the Murex shellfish. This purple dye was highly valued and held royal connotations in the ancient world. It also gave the Phoenicians their name from the Greeks, Phoenicus, which means purple people. The city-state was the most powerful in all of Phoenicia after surpassing its sister state Sidon. Tyre is referenced in the Bible in the New Testament, where both Jesus and Paul visited the city and remains famous in military history for Alexander the Great's siege. And interestingly, Tyre is also listed by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. Tyre was in its golden age around the 10th century BCE and in the 8th was colonizing other states in the area and enjoying great wealth and prosperity owing primarily to an alliance with Israel. The Tyrian alliance and trade agreement with David, king of Israel, was initiated by the king of Tyre, Ababel, who sent the new king Timber from the cedars of Lebanon, as Ababel's son, Hiram, is said to have done for David's son, Solomon. This alliance resulted in a very lucrative partnership which benefited both parties. According to the historian Richard Miles, commercially this deal not only gave Tyre privileged access to the valuable markets of Israel, Judea, and northern Syria, it also provided further opportunities for joint overseas ventures. Indeed, a Tyrian Israelite expedition traveled to the Sudan and Somalia and perhaps even as far as the Indian Ocean. Another noteworthy development which encouraged the wealth of Tyre seems to have been a religious revolution in the city under the reigns of Ababel and Hiram, which elevated the god known as Melkert, a deified version of Hercules, over the traditional divine couple of the Phoenicians, Baal also known as El, and Astarte or Asherah. The primacy of Melkart, whose name means king of the city, drew power away from the priest of the traditional pantheon of the gods and placed it at the disposal of the palace. Richard Miles notes, it seems that a desire to bring the temples to heel lay behind the royal decision to replace the traditional chief deities of Tyre with a new god, Melkart. The result was not only an increase in the wealth of the palace, but through a more efficient distribution of that wealth, increased prosperity for the whole of the city. At that time, the king, not the priest, was the bridge between the temporal and celestial worlds, and the needs of the heavenly gods could closely correspond with the political exigencies of the palace. This new religious policy encouraged a more closely knit bond among the people of the city by designating them as set apart from the other city-states of Phoenicia and so special in the eyes of their god. Miles writes, The king even introduced an elaborate new ceremonial to celebrate the annual festival of Melkart. Each spring, in a carefully choreographed festival called the Egersis, an effigy of the god was placed on a giant raft before being ritually burnt as it drifted out to sea while hymns were sung by the assembled crowds. For the Tyrians, as for many other ancient Near Eastern peoples, the emphasis fell upon the restorative properties of fire, for the god himself was not destroyed, but revived by the smoke, and the burning of the effigy thus represented rebirth. To emphasize the importance of the Egersis in maintaining the internal cohesion of the Tyrian people, all foreigners had to leave the city for the duration of the ceremony. And it was this ceremony and the importance it held for the people which would bring about Tyre's destruction and the slaughter or enslavement of the populace. 
In 332 BCE, Alexander the Great arrived at the city, fresh from the subjugation of Sidon, and demanded Tyre's surrender. Following Sidon's lead, the Tyrians acknowledged Alexander's greatness and presented him with gifts. All seemed to be going well, and, pleased with their submission, Alexander said he would present a sacrifice in honor of their god in the temple of Melkart. The Tyrians could not allow this, as it would be sacrilegious for a foreigner to present a sacrifice in the holy home of their god, and even more so, as the ceremony of the Agersis was close at hand. The historian Worthington presents what followed. Azamilk, king of Tyre, proposed a compromise. Tyre would become Alexander's ally, but he should sacrifice on the mainland at Old Tyre opposite the island. An angry Alexander sent envoys to say this was unacceptable and that the Tyrians had to surrender. They murdered the envoys and threw them off their walls. Alexander then ordered the siege of Tyre. He dismantled much of the old mainland city of Ushu as well as using fallen debris, rock, and felled trees, filling in the sea between the mainland and the island to create a land bridge for his war machines. Over the centuries since this caused heavy sedimentation to occur and permanently linked the island to the mainland, which is why Tyre is not an island today. After a siege of seven months, Alexander used his man-made causeway to batter down the walls of Tyre and take the city. Tyre's 30,000 inhabitants were either massacred or sold into slavery, and the city was destroyed by Alexander in his rage at their having defied him for so long. The fall of Tyre led to the rise of Carthage as the survivors of the siege who were able to escape Alexander's wrath by bribery or stealth, founded the new city in the north of Africa. Following Alexander's death in 323 BCE, his general Seleucus I took control of the region of Phoenicia, including Tyre, and rebuilt it. But the city was again destroyed in 315 BCE by Alexander's rival, General Antigonus. The Romans took the ruined city as a colony in 64 BCE, when Pompey annexed the whole of Phoenicia to the Roman Empire. Tyre was rebuilt under the Romans, who, ironically, destroyed the city of Carthage the surviving Tyrians had founded. Rome built the roads, monuments, and aqueducts, which can still be seen in the modern-day city, and the city flourished under Roman rule, but declined after the fall of the empire. It continued on as a port city under the eastern half of Rome, the Byzantine Empire, until the 7th century CE, when it was taken in the Muslim conquest of the region. Ancient Tyre and Sidon is now known today as Lebanon, which is made up of a majority of people who practice Catholicism. Now, if you recall, as I began sharing with you some history about Tyre, I also shared with you that Tyre is the birthplace of Europa. Europa is the woman who rides the beast. Now you can see here on the screen, this is an artist depiction of Europa. And let's go ahead and take a look at that. Now, Europa is very similar to the woman the book of Revelation talks about who is holding the golden cup, wearing the scarlet and the purple, riding the red beast with many heads. And you can see an artist rendition of that here on the screen as well. So both are very similar. So I just wanted to make sure all of you noticed that Europa was birthed in Tyre. Now this brings us to our next subject, Pope Francis. Pope Francis, formerly Cardinal George Mario Bergoglia, before he became the Pope, decided that he wanted to take on the name of Pope Francis. And the reason he chose this name had everything to do, he said, with St. Francis of Assisi. St. Francis of Assisi is the patron saint for ecologists 
a title honoring his boundless love for animals and mother nature. But what many people may not know is that later in life, Francis of Assisi reportedly received a vision that left him with the stigmata of Christ, marks resembling the wounds Jesus Christ suffered when he was crucified, making Francis of Assisi the first person to receive such holy wounds. He was canonized as saint on July 16th of 1228. During his life, he also developed a deep love of nature and animals and is known as the patron saint of the environment and animals. His life and words have had a lasting resonance with millions of followers across the globe. Each October, many animals the world over are blessed on his feast day. Saint Francis of Assisi, whom I just shared some details about, is the saint that Pope Francis chose his name from. Interestingly enough, when we discussed Jezebel, Jezebel, of course, worshipped the nature god Baal. So Baal, of course, is the nature god. Now we go back to all the things I've shared with you about the Jesuits and they're huge as well about nature. You can go to their website. They're very much so into environmentalism and save the earth and all of those things. As we know, Asherah and the other names I mentioned, which are the same goddess, is the earth goddess. The most important of the natural forces, especially for women, was Asherah, the earth from which all life sprang. She was the great mother of plants, animals, and humans. She had the gift of life within her because she could produce new life from her own body. Now, most of you may remember that back in 2013, before Pope Francis became the Pope, Pope Benedict stepped down and the whole thing was highly unexpected. The resignation of Pope Benedict occurred on the 28th of February of 2013, after having been announced on the morning of February 11th of 2013 directly by himself. Benedict's decision to step down as leader of the Catholic Church made him the first pope to relinquish the office since Gregory XII in 1415, who did so in order to end the Western Schism, the first to do so on his own initiative since Celestine V in 1294. The move was quite unexpected given the popes in the modern era have held the position from election until death. The Pope stated that the reason for his decision was his declining health due to old age. The conclave to select his successor began on March 12, 2013 and elected Cardinal George Mario Bergoglia, Archbishop of Buenos Aires, Argentina, who took the name of Francis as I just went over with you. Francis is the first Jesuit Pope, the first Pope from the Americas, the first from the Southern Hemisphere, and the first Pope from outside Europe since the Syrian Gregory III, who reigned in the 8th century. And one can hardly deny noticing the extent at which Pope Francis has gone to try to bring people of all walks of life and all religions together. Only a day after he became the Pope, he met with numerous religious leaders in Rome at the Vatican. He greeted a diverse group of religious leaders in the ornate Clementine Hall inside the Apostolic Palace of the Vatican. Among them were Bartholomew I, the spiritual leader of Orthodox Christians, as well as other Orthodox leaders, representatives from different Protestant denominations, Jewish and Muslim leaders and advocates, and representatives of the Buddhist, Sikh, Hindu, and Jainist faiths. In fact, the Vice President of the Italian Islamic Religious Community shook hands with Pope Francis and presented him with a book exploring the contemplative dimensions of Islam. He said he was touched when Francis expressed his gratitude for the presence of Muslim leaders in the room and he predicted that the new Pope would deepen the relationship between Catholics and Muslims. He stated, I think he will take interreligious dialogue among people. 
He will make it closer to people, not confined to theological exchanges among scholars or political, territorial, and international conflicts. In fact, one article from Vatican Media stated that Pope Francis is the most appreciated world leader on the planet, with a global approval rating of 56%. However, those who follow closely the Word of God and know how to identify a false prophet and someone who appears as an angel of light have some real disturbing questions and have noticed some very disturbing things about not only the Catholic Church, but Pope Francis, the first Jesuit to become a Pope. For example, in an article titled Pope Vows He Won't Be Slowed Down by Ultra Conservatives, published on July 3rd of 2016, the article states, Pope Francis has vowed in a new interview that he won't be slowed down by resistance from ultra conservatives in the church who say no to everything, insisting, I'm going ahead without looking over my shoulder. The pontiff also suggested that he has no intention of launching a crackdown on the opposition, saying, I don't cut off heads. That was never my style. I've never liked doing that. I found it rather odd that Pope Francis would make such a statement as the statement kind of seemed off the wall for the article. And Pope Francis has made no secret about the fact that he supports the LGBT community. In an article on The Guardian titled, The Pope Says God Made Gay People Just As We Should Be, Here's why his comments matter. Francis's reported remarks show a new Catholic acceptance of LGBT people and confirm what many of us have always known, God doesn't make mistakes. It is immensely powerful to hear that Pope Francis, the leader of the Roman Catholic Church, reportedly told Juan Carlos Cruz, a gay man, God made you like this and loves you like this. And then on October 1st of 2019, it was reported that Pope Francis met with a pro-LGBT priest. The article stated, is Pope Francis leaning toward changing the church's long-held position of condemning homosexuality? The article goes on to say a decision by Pope Francis to host a private meeting at the Vatican on Monday with an American Catholic priest who has been an outspoken advocate for the church to embrace LGBT Catholics, is being viewed as yet another signal that Francis may be leaning toward changing the church's long-held position of condemning homosexuality. Now, moving along to more current events, there are a few things that are also quite eye-catching. An article on Market Watch titled, Here's what Pope Francis said about the global economy that drew a wow from a former presidential candidate. This may be the time to consider a universal basic wage which would acknowledge and dignify the noble essential tasks you carry out. It would ensure and concretely achieve the ideal at once so human and so Christian of no worker without rights. That's Pope Francis showing support for an idea many countries are at least temporarily experimenting with amid the economic disruption sparked by the coronavirus pandemic. I know that you have been excluded from the benefits of globalization. The ills that afflict everyone hit you twice as hard, Pope Francis wrote in his letter. Street vendors, recyclers, carnies, small farmers, construction workers, dressmakers, the different kinds of caregivers, you who are informal, working on your own or in the grassroots economy, you have no steady income to get you through this hard time and the lockdowns are becoming unbearable. The letter drew praise on Twitter from Andrew Yang who spent much of his failed campaign for the presidency pushing universal basic income. Now on the surface, it sounds very nice and like he is very caring and thoughtful, but it seems to me that Pope Francis is doing something that is trying to bring everything into a universal perspective, bring the whole world together under one leadership. 
And on April 4th this year, 2020, something else very awkward, to say the least, took place. It was reported in LifeSite News that Archbishop Vigano said, Has Pope Francis now disavowed being Vicar of Christ? The Pope now seems to declare himself absolute monarch, even with respect to Christ, according to the Archbishop. He went on to add, This change in the layout and content of an official text of the Catholic Church cannot be ignored, nor is it possible to attribute it to a gesture of humility on the part of Francis, which is not in keeping with his name being so prominently featured, wrote Vigano in a statement he sent to LifeSite News. Instead, Vigano continued, it seems possible to see in it the admission, passed over in silence, of a sort of usurpation, whereby it is not the, the servant of the servants of God who reigns, but the person of George Mario Bergoglio, who has officially disavowed being the Vicar of Christ, the successor of the Prince of the Apostles, and the Supreme Pontiff as if they were annoying trappings of the past, only mere historical titles, he added. Archbishop Vigano said, It's as if Pope Francis now views himself as becoming master of the church, free to demolish it from within without having to answer to anyone. In short, a tyrant, he said. Cardinal Gerard Mueller, former prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, also raised concern about the Pope's move, calling the change theological barbarism. No Pope or ecumenical council, the German prelate continued, could, with reference to their highest authority over the church, do away with the primacy, the episcoposopy, or the sacraments, or to reinterpret them in their essence. And though I don't place much importance on prophecies outside of the Bible, this video would be incomplete without mentioning it. And that is, of course, the eerie prophecy about Pope Francis being the last Pope. The prophecies of the Irish Saint Malachi, the 12th century Bishop of Armagh, have thrilled and dismayed readers for centuries. He has stated there would be only one more Pope after Benedict, and during his reign comes the end of the world. So, does that mean that Pope Francis will indeed be the last Pope? The prediction in full is this. In the final persecution of the Holy Roman Church, there will reign Peter the Roman, who will feed his flock amid many tribulations, after which the seven-hilled city will be destroyed, and the dreadful judge will judge the people. The end. The father of the current Pope Francis was Peter, or Pietro, and was from Italy, even though the family moved to Argentina. In 1139, then Archbishop Malachi went to Rome from Ireland to give an account of his affairs. While there, he received a strange vision about the future that included the name of every Pope, 112 and all from his time, who would rule until the end of time. We are now at the last prophecy. His predictions are taken very seriously. As one report states, in 1958, before the conclave that would elect Pope John XXIII, Cardinal Spellman of New York hired a boat, filled it with sheep, and sailed up and down the Tiber River to show that he was pastor et nature, the motto attributed to the next Pope in the prophecies. As for the prophecy concerning the 111th Pope, Pope Benedict, the prophecy says of him, Gloria Olive, which means the glory of the olive. The order of Saint Benedict is also known as the Olivetans, which many claim make Malachi's prophecies correct. The next and final Pope then should be Peter Romanus. Saint Malachi gave an account of his visions to Pope Innocent II, but the document remained unknown in the Roman archives until its discovery in 1590. As a result, there has been much speculation since there was no proof up until 1590 of this document being written. Many of the prophecies are spot on. For example, the one about Urban VIII is Lilium et Rosa, which means the lily and the rose. He was a native of Florence and on the arms of Florence figure 
a fleur de lis pope john paul ii is de labre solis meaning of the eclipse of the sun peregrinus apostolus pilgrim pope which designates pius VI, appears to be verified by his many journeys to new lands so then the question remains will pope francis indeed be the last pope the irish seer of the 12th century has said it will be so but only time will tell what a lot of people don't understand or realize is that the popes the cardinals the bishops and the priests of rome are worshipers of the babylon sun god timas in the middle of saint peter's square is an ancient egyptian obelisk which represents the sun god ra of egypt it was placed in the middle of a giant sun wheel which is lined up with the solar solstices and equinoxes when an obelisk is placed in front of a temple it designates it as a place of sun worship the egyptian obelisk sits directly in front of saint peter's basilica designating it as a temple of sun worship the pagans believe that their sun god is conceived on march the 21st the spring equinox you can see this played out annually at the vatican when the rising sun causes the shadow of the egyptian obelisk which by the way is a phallic symbol representing nimrod the sun god to fall towards the dome of saint peter's basilica symbolizing the womb of the moon goddess semiramis representing their annual sexual union nine months later their son tamaz is born the cross on top of the obelisk actually is the letter t which represents the sun god tamaz the pagans believe that on the winter solstice 1221 that the sun god dies as the sun is at its furthest point away from the earth that it is dead for three days and then is reborn so they celebrate his rebirth on december the 25th Tamaz, who was symbolically conceived at the vatican on 321 is the reincarnation of the sun god nimrod his birthday is celebrated on christ mass and that's christ dash mass Please note that more than likely the Messiah Jesus Christ was born during the fall on the Feast of Tabernacles. Christ Mass symbolically represents the birth of the Roman sun god Sol Invictus, which points back to the Babylonian sun god Timaz. St. Peter's Basilica has a huge sun symbol behind the stage where the Pope sits and the pope also has a monstrance that he holds in his hand which also has a symbol of the sun the basilica of saint mary and the martyrs used to be the roman pantheon which housed their pagan gods it too has an egyptian obelisk in front of it designating it as a temple of sun worship the catholic mass is performed in a place that was built to worship all pagan gods interestingly the eucharist host wafer is round representing the sun god they hold it up to revere it then they place it on a crescent moon representing the female womb of the moon goddess which represents their symbolic sexual union this symbolically makes the wafer the flesh of their sun god Timaz. this is carried out every day thousands of times a day throughout the world the Eucharist wafer also has a T on it, which represents their sun god, Tammuz, not the cross of Jesus. On Ash Wednesday, they mark the foreheads of Catholics with a T for Tammuz. However, innocent worshipers of Catholicism believe that it is a cross of Jesus Christ being placed on their foreheads. The 40 days of Lent symbolizes the 40 years that Tammuz lived. Lent ends with Easter when it is tradition to eat ham, this symbolizes the remembrance of Tammuz, who was killed by a wild boar. The top leaders of the Roman Catholic Church worship the sun god of Babylon, which is ultimately Satan worship. They fulfill the prophecy of Mystery Babylon the Great, as they worship the pagan gods of Babylon under the guise of Christianity, and they cause innocent Catholics to unknowingly partake in these pagan rituals. In Revelation 18:4, the Messiah Jesus Christ told Catholics to come out of the harlot church before it is too late. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive none of her plagues. 
Worship the true Messiah in the scriptures. Do not worship the false one that was created by the popes of Rome. Come out of Babylon before it is too late. Hopefully now with what I have just shared with you, maybe the passage in Revelation chapter 2 beginning with verse 18 about the church of Thyatira will make more sense. Let's just go ahead and go over it now while that is all still fresh in your head. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest of Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I just showed you and I've shown you throughout this whole video and I still have a lot more to show you here that's very, very important. So stay with me. But I have just shown you how a lot of the worship that goes on within the Catholic Church relates to Baal and to very sexual things. So it goes back to Baal worship. So I have revealed that to you. And now that I've shared Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29, hopefully that will make more sense to you. And for those of you who are still with me at this point, if you're Catholic or if you have been Catholic and you have not repented, I just want to urge you to repent. I'm no religion. I'm non-denominational spirit filled. I don't want to belong to a denomination. I am just a Holy Spirit filled woman who to the best of my ability follows the word of God. And when I sin, I repent. And if it's things that I have struggled with, then I ask the Lord to help me with those struggles. Please do the same. And I hope that you will because time is very short and God makes it very clear what is going to happen to the Catholic Church and those who continue to practice in it. And another thing many people are unaware of, in fact, I was unaware of it, but the Catholics altered the Ten Commandments. As you can see here on the screen, the second commandment that says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath. And they removed it and then they separated the ninth and the tenth commandment, the original correct Ten Commandments say, number nine, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Number 10, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's property, his house, his wife, or animals, etc. So since they removed the second commandment about worshiping or making any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, they had to accommodate for that missing commandment. So they split up the 10th commandment into two commandments. Number nine, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Number 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. So the Bible says that removing anything from it or adding anything to it is an abomination. And it actually goes into more detail about that. So this is a big time no-no. 
So now before we go any further, we're going to take a look at Isaiah chapter 23. It is the proclamation against Tyre. And if you recall, I gave you extensive details about the history of Tyre, about Jezebel, the daughter of the Baal priest. And he also was the king of Sidon and Tyre. And we know Jezebel was considered the daughter of Sidon. Now, at the time, it had just been called Sidon because it had not yet split into Tyre and Sidon. I have shown you how the Catholic Mary goes all the way back to Nimrod, to Semiramis, Ashtoreth, and Astarte, and many of the false female gods revolving around Baal. And of course, Jezebel was the princess and she was the daughter of this priest named Ethbaal. So Jezebel very much so represents in the Bible and it's used in the book of Revelation to represent the Catholic church. So let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 23 and we're going to look at verse 12. And he said, you will rejoice no more, O you oppressed virgin daughter of Sidon. Arise, cross over to Cyprus. There also you will have no rest. The daughter of Sidon, symbolically speaking, in this context, would be Jezebel. Who is the virgin? Virgin Mary. And we're not talking about the true Virgin Mary in the Bible. We are talking about the false god that the catholics worship that particular mary so we're going to move down to verse 15 and you're going to see something really really interesting here now it shall come to pass in that day that tyre will be forgotten 70 years according to the days of one king at the end of 70 years it will happen to tyre as in the song of the harlot so now we're talking about a harlot and we're talking about Tyre. Take a harp, go about the city, you forgotten harlot. Hmm, forgotten harlot, mystery Babylon. Make sweet melody, sing many songs that you may be remembered. And it shall be at the end of 70 years that the Lord will deal with Tyre. She will return to her hire and commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth. Her gain and her pay will be set apart for the Lord. It will not be treasured nor laid up. For her gain will be for those who dwell before the Lord to eat sufficiently and for fine clothing. So now let's take a look at a couple things here since we read that verse. Let's look at the scarlet woman and the scarlet beast in Revelation 17. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast which was full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. Now I'm going to pause there. If you recall, I showed you earlier in this video that Europa was birthed in Tyre. Europa is the woman on the beast. Verse 4, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Now we know that the Antichrist is going to be responsible for killing many, 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 many Christians. But the Catholic Church, as a side note, has already been responsible for killing millions of Christians. It is Satan who has empowered the Roman emperors, the Roman popes, and the Roman Jesuit generals. The enemy created his own church way back when, the Roman Catholic Church, to deceive people into a false religion and to use them to obey the commands of the pope in killing the true 
saint. Roman Emperor Constantine created the Roman Catholic Church in the 4th century and he is arguably its first pope. After Satan had used the Roman emperors to try to wipe out the early church, killing 10 million saints, the Church of Messiah kept growing. Since the Roman Empire at that time began to decline, Satan changed strategies and had Emperor Constantine create the Roman religion of Catholicism, which is based on pagan god worship with a veneer of the true faith. So, as you can see here, they were responsible for killing millions of Christians. So, going back to that verse, let's reread the verse from Isaiah again. Now it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre will be forgotten 70 years, according to the days of one king. At the end of 70 years, it will happen to Tyre as in the song of the harlot. So a harlot is mentioned. Who is writing the beast in the book of Revelation? A harlot. Take a harp, go about the city, you forgotten harlot. Make sweet melody, sing many songs that you may be remembered. And it shall be at the end of 70 years that the Lord will deal with Tyre. She will return to her hire and commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth. And what did we read in Revelation 17? It says, come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, that's Rome, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast which was full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication and on her forehead a name was written mystery babylon the great the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth i saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of jesus and when i saw her i marveled with great amazement now i have shown you all throughout this entire video from the very start how this goes all the way back to nimrod and his wife and mother samiramis and to the ancient gods, Baal and the nature gods. I have shown you about the Jesuits. I have revealed history to you about how they are responsible for murdering millions of Christians, about the dark, evil, wicked side of them. I have shown you how the Catholic Church engages in Baal worship. I have shown you how the Catholic Mary is actually the Jezebel spoken of in the Bible. And that goes back to Tyre and Sidon. And it goes back to Eth Baal, Jezebel's father, who not only was the king of Tyre and Sidon, but he also was the Baal priest over Astarte, Ashtoreth, or Asmiramis, however you want because they're all the same goddess with different names. They all revolve around nature. The Catholics and the Jesuits revere mother nature and their nature lovers. And they are the ones behind everything to do with all of the save the earth type stuff and so forth. I have shown you all of it, but there's one more important thing that we cannot go without mentioning and that is the false prophet so i have always felt that the antichrist just like many of us is going to be some government political leader or a president or something like that interestingly enough i have shown you that the vatican is a state of its own they are not really a church they're a political establishment and i have shown you that throughout this video I have never believed that the Pope was the Antichrist. I've always felt like he was the false prophet until the Lord revealed all of this to me recently. So I don't know. I'm just showing you what the Lord has revealed to me 
Is it possible the Pope could be the Antichrist? He makes himself like God. People bow down to him and worship him. He puts himself in the place of God. People have to go and confess their sins and repent to him. They worship Baal. I mean, I could go on and on. You know and you see how the Pope and the entire papacy makes itself like God. Like the Catholic Church has a right to remove some of the Ten Commandments. The Catholic Church has a right to do this and that. They are a state. They are a political establishment. As I've shown you, they are very dark and very evil. He is the one who sits on a throne. They are responsible as well. And many of you already know this, who know about Jesuits. They own and control everything. They own all seven of the mountains, which is the seven mountain mandate of the new apostolic reformation movement, or better known by some as dominionist. And I mean, this is just huge. I used to oftentimes wonder, okay, is the antichrist going to be a presidential leader? You know, when Obama was president, and I know there's many of you out there, you still think that Obama is the antichrist. I guess we'll all find out here soon because we're headed in that direction. But what I want to say to you is that I used to think it was going to be some presidential leader or something. And I really feel like the man who's going to be the antichrist could very well be the Pope. Let me show you one more passage here. So in Isaiah, we read the proclamation against Tyre. Now we're going to look at Ezekiel 28, which is the proclamation against the king of Tyre. Now 28, 1 through 10 is actually referring, it says Prince, it's actually referring, I believe, to the man before Satan comes into him, before he becomes the Antichrist. Now when I read this 1 through 10, I can clearly see the Pope. It says, starting with verse one, the word of the Lord came to me again, saying, son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God. Now notice it says prince here. I just want to point that out again. Because your heart is lifted up and you say, I am a God. I sit in the seat of gods in the midst of the seas. Yet you are a man and not a God. Though you set your heart as the heart of a God, behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that can be hidden from you. With your wisdom and your understanding, you have gained riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom and trade, you have increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of a God, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall throw you down into the pit and you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. Will you still say before him who slays you, I am a God, but you shall be a man and not a god in the hand of him who slays you you shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of aliens for i have spoken says the lord god now we're going to go ahead and read beginning with verse 11. so this was about the man before satan enters into him and god is telling him what's going to happen to him first he tells him who he is what he's about what he's saying about himself and god says but you're a man you're not a god and god tells him what's going to happen to him so verse 11 moreover the word of the lord came to me saying son of man take up a lamentation for the king of tyre and say to him thus says the lord god now it's the king okay to me this is when satan enters into the man who's going to be the antichrist because now it's specifically talking about Satan and it goes through the history of Satan from the fall until the very end, like way at the end when he's finally destroyed once and for all. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. 
You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created, till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings, that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. Okay, very, very interesting. Now, I also want to add when I was discussing the Pope, he has done everything he can to show this humility going all over the world, meeting with various religious leaders and kneeling before them and just showing this great act of humility to everyone. And so he comes across as this loving, kind man who is just so humble. He comes across just like the very image that we would imagine of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, he also appeals to the sinful world by saying basically that homosexuality isn't a sin. You know, who am I to judge and all sorts of things. And I believe so many people are fooled. The Bible specifically tells us that Satan can and will appear as an angel of light and people will be deceived by the Antichrist. They will be very deceived. So then the question begs to be answered. If the Pope is indeed the man who will be the Antichrist, who then is the false prophet? Find out in part two of this documentary video in which we will expose the traits of the false prophet and the person or establishment that best suits the role of the false prophet. We will explore every aspect of who and what the false prophet is. And by the end of it all, we will have a much better picture of who best plays the role of the person who will be the antichrist and who best plays the role of the person or entity who will be the false prophet. There is one thing, however, that most all of us can know for sure. The man who will be the Antichrist and the establishment or person who will be the false prophet or is the false prophet is alive and well on this earth right here and right now and is going to be exposed before the eyes of all of us very soon. And when the Antichrist and the false prophet are both exposed, know the facts and most of all, know the word of God and do not be deceived because deception is here. Deception is going to get worse. Deception will creep around and slither around like a bow constrictor and squeeze you tightly until you are suffocated and can no longer breathe. And by the time you realize what has happened, it will be too late.